Hello, and welcome to our webinar today about small-scale manufacturing and two reports, one made in place and the second one, discovering your city's maker economy, uh, reports recently released by Smart Growth America and the National League of Cities. My name is Ilana Proust, and I am with Recast City, a consulting firm that had the honor of working on both reports. And we are bringing you this webinar today in partnership with Smart Growth America and NLC, as well as the U.S. Economic Development Administration, to share lessons learned and some best practices out of each of these reports, as well as to take any questions about how to apply this work within your community. Our speakers today include Ryan Smith from the U.S. Economic Development Administration, Chris Zimmerman from Smart Growth America, Emily Robbins from the National League of Cities, and myself, Ilana Proust from Recast City. And when, just before we get started into the details, um, to make sure we're all on the same page, when we talk about small-scale manufacturing and maker businesses, we're talking about businesses that are producing a tangible good that they can replicate and sell. These businesses might be creating consumer goods, uh, like a textile product or a bag, and these businesses might be creating a 3D printed industrial piece that goes into a larger machinery. And so these are all different types of materials and businesses that are producing tangible goods. They might be creating barbecue sauce, um, and they might be in a shared commercial kitchen space, or, or they might be in a 20,000 square foot space but they're all small businesses, under 40 or 50 employees, and they fit really well into our neighborhood. And so today we're going to discuss this topic both from an economic development standpoint as well as from a land use standpoint. But before we get into the details, I'm going to hand the reins over to Ryan Smith from the US EDA, who's going to talk about EDA's role in funding the Smart Growth America project. Ryan? Thanks, Alana. Again, I'm Ryan Smith. I am the Research and National Technical Assistance Coordinator for the U.S. Economic Development Administration. Uh, we reside in the Performance and National Programs Division of EDA. One of the things that I wanted to talk about just for a few minutes as we kick off today's call um, is how EDA visions long-term prosperity. EDA's mission space is defined by leading the federal economic agenda. Um, and we do that through a number of means and a number of programs. Um, but primarily, we are a federal agency designed to support community-driven efforts for economic development. EDA has made, uh, this is all available on EDA's website, but EDA has made uh, four pillars to the economic development definition uh, as far as EDA is concerned. We focus on building capacity. We focus on a sustained increase in prosperity and quality of life. And we focus on supporting institutions, um, all of which you see in the project that we're talking about today. Um, and developing the necessary conditions for economic growth. So who does EDA work with? This is a good question. Um, EDA works primarily with communities um, and community organizations, community economic development organizations, and um, and most specifically, the most distressed communities. Uh, EDA does uh, a number of different programs, runs a number of different programs. Primarily, our grants are focused on infrastructure and public works. Um, but we also have a, another set of capacity building programs, such as Research Innovation Strategies Program and the Research National Technical Assistance Program, which helps to uh, understand better what's going on in terms of economic development trends throughout the country. This project was funded through a research, uh, a research and national technical assistance grant uh, cooperative agreement um, through EDA's National Technical Assistance Program, uh, whereby EDA works with SGA and Recast City 
to go out into communities and do this kind of engagement and one-on-one -on -one work. You can find out more information about that program as well as EDA's other programs uh, at the EDA website. And you can find out your region by taking a look at this map, which region you're in. Um, I think that's all I planned to say today, but I'm about to hand this off to Chris, who's going to talk a little bit more about the specifics behind this program. Here you go, Chris. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, and I am Chris Zimmerman with Smart Growth America. Uh, we do a lot of technical assistance around the country with communities large and small who are seeking, as communities always have, to grow their own local economies uh, and trying to find the best strategies to do that. And uh, we provide a lot of uh, different kinds of uh, advice and analysis uh, to assist them. Uh, and we found some things in common uh, that they have, and we you know, provided um, a sort of guidebook, for instance, uh, on how to go about this. Uh, in the 21st century in which we have a different economy and a different demographics than prevailed in the 20th century. And so for communities looking uh, to take advantage of the new opportunities and deal with the new challenges, there are a number of things that you know, we find in common. Uh, and many of them are recognizing that a lot of this has to do with uh, the new emphasis on downtowns, whether that is a large metropolitan area or a suburban area looking to create a downtown that didn't exist or a small town that had a great main street and wants to bring it back. Um, and the large part of uh, this really comes down to the fact that in the 21st century, economic development is much about placemaking, uh, creating these great walkable places that uh, have a unique character that can draw people uh, both to serve the local community, the people who live in a, in a town or in a region, and to draw people from uh, far, uh, far away. Uh, this is a large part of what uh, communities have to focus on to be successful in the 21st century. So uh, that is the context in which we came to this question about small-scale manufacturing. Uh, we have a, you know, this, this new situation where many places are looking to you know, see what they can do for their main streets, uh, and that, you know, that has certain implications. Um, it's, you know, it's really about um, how do you use, in many cases, some old spaces, uh, I say main streets, but I should say also old industrial warehouse districts are in many ways becoming you know, kind of new downtowns, and there's much interest there. So some of it is about using legacy buildings and giving them new life, um, but you know, th this has certain implications. You're, you're trying to take advantage of the assets that you have and um, turn them into something you know, with, with new demand. Uh, we did a study a while back uh, where we looked at some specific examples of communities, again, of different sizes, that are successfully using this kind of, of strategy. And although the circumstances vary uh, with the size of the community, with its geography, with their own history, and so on, there are some things, again, that they have in common. Um, and I would say in all cases, you know, you need economic activity. Uh, it's very hard to, you know, make any of this work or to create a great place if, if there isn't something driving it, if there isn't, you know, if there aren't actual jobs being created. Um, you also need to, people to activate a space uh, if it's going to be, uh, you know, a great place that, that, that people see as exciting and vibrant. Uh, then you actually have to have people there. Uh, and that's all great, and so that's you know, part of the formula. Um, but the reality today is that one of the challenges we have uh, in, in that kind of placemaking is it implies the need for retail space, but you know, retail has, has its own challenges with much of it moving to the Internet and online purchases. So what happens to bricks and mortar? Uh, not every space is going to be filled by a restaurant, although that clearly is an important part of strategy for most places. Uh, and office uh, needs are also you know, shrinking. We're using fewer uh, you know, square feet per, per employee. So again, how do you create this vibrant place uh, where you need this activity? And so small-scale manufacturing uh, is, can be part of an answer to that. Uh, it gives you an opportunity for an activity that you know, it is economic activity. There are jobs involved. There are people working. Uh, you know, there will people be there on, who will be there on site uh, producing goods of various kinds. Um, and, but it also gives you the possibility to fill some of these spaces um, and, you know, and partly answer that question of, you know, what do we do? So it's this combination of needing economic activity, economic activity that's locally generated uh, and needing ways to activate spaces that makes small-scale small manufacturing 
uh, a potentially good strategy for a lot of communities as part of an overall placemaking strategy for economic development. Now, uh, just to say a few things about small-scale manufacturing and uh, you know the kind of things we're talking about. Um, you know, for the most part, the, we are talking about small business, and although economic development often focuses on you know landing the the really uh, big fish, the you know the large company that's going to have many employees, the uh, large shopping center, and so on. Um, the, the fact is, as people involved in economic development know, uh, a, a large percentage of jobs uh, created are actually uh, from small business, and for a local community, that's particularly valuable because the large employer comes from outside, can also leave and go somewhere else. So uh, you have uh, the potential to promote small business, uh, create jobs, and boost the local economy because the dollars uh, that, that are spent there tend to be spent in the in the locality or region uh, more than some others. It also provides some advantages in terms of trying to create uh, work by uh, creating a different kinds of uh, demand, and in particular, uh, in uh, terms of educational attainment uh, for uh, a variety of folks who may not have advanced degrees. Uh, there are opportunities here that they might not otherwise have in other kinds of industry. Um, similarly, uh, in terms of diversifying the workforce, we find that small-scale manufacturing uh, creates a uh, more inclusive uh, economy uh, with uh, many of the firms uh, being, for instance, started by women, uh, by people of color, and so on. So you can accomplish some other goals uh, that the community has as well uh, through small-scale manufacturing. Uh, and then, of course, there are, we can talk a little bit, um, and some of the other speakers may touch on this more, about the kinds of things that we mean when we talk about small-scale manufacturing. Uh, you know, at one time, of course, manufacturing was something that was uh, not only larger scale, but generally not clean. And that's part of the reason why we got the, uh, the movement of separating uh, manufacturing industry generally from other areas of activity. Part of the reason this is possible now is because while some of these are very traditional activities, some of them are being done in new ways, and for the most part we're talking about activities that are compatible with other kinds of, of human activity. They're generally, uh, you know, they're not necessarily noisy, they're not uh, necessarily polluting um, and so they, they're more compatible. Um, some of them are artisan kind of industries. Uh, some of them are, are small production services. Uh, in some cases, they're serving markets uh, on a retail basis, and so you know, they want access to that retail, but many of them are uh, people who are producing items for other businesses and supporting other businesses. Some of them are interested in growing and will be small for a while, and then we'll look uh, the opportunity to grow, move, uh, you know, move up, become a bigger kind of industry, and some of them aren't. Some of them are going to stay a small scale. They range from, you know, food food service, uh, uh, you know, catering and things like that, uh, to manufacturing uh, crafts and other goods. Uh, there's really quite a variety of different types of activities that can fall into this. Um, but, you know, again, what we're interested in particularly, on, and what we focused on is how these can all add to you know, kind of filling that space to helping to create a vibrant, active place uh, that uh, strengthens the neighborhood, that creates a vibrancy for uh, a place and uh, diversifies the uh, local economy. Uh, and, and a combination of these things has the potential to do that. They can use a variety of different sorts of spaces, of course. You know, as I said, there's, you know, there are different kinds. There are those that they are going to want small storefronts. Uh, because they have a retail component, for instance. Um, they create interest in part because people sometimes not only want to go buy, but want to go see what's being done. And with some of these, it's appropriate you know, for people to be able to watch uh, the process itself. Um, so you know, that's, that's one, kind of, uh, one kind of use. Um, there, as I said, are a variety of different categories, and that will uh, drive a lot of what's needed in terms of space. Um, so for instance, uh, many of them uh, work in food service. They may be supplying, for instance, food trucks or catering businesses. And any individual person with a small operation and you know, one or two or three employees might not be able to afford all the uh, equipment that really makes their business viable, but a collection of them can. And so through, through uh, shared use of equipment, uh, as in a kitchen, for instance, uh, you can have multiple viable businesses supported by limited capital. This is not only true in food service, it may be true in uh, things like uh, you know, ceramics where you, know, you might have a number of businesses sharing a kiln uh, or other kinds of industrial equipment. Um, so you know, this is where, again, local policy may come in to help facilitate the creation of these spaces, whether they are entirely private, quasi-private, you, know, uh, you know, or publicly uh, provided. Um, you're probably going to need some kind of uh, policy 
or uh, local government uh, initiative in many cases to, to make something like this uh, come about. Uh, so at any rate, uh, there are a variety of different kinds of spaces that can be used and filled, a variety of different kinds of needs, and this makes this a very localized concern. Uh, this is the part where uh, you know, it's not, it's not going to be the same everywhere. It's not, it doesn't have a cookie cutter uh, response, um, but um, it has to respond to local needs, which can make it, uh, although you know, that's a complexity, that is also a strength because this is part of what will lend an area and its own approach uh, kind of a uniqueness and authenticity that is um, something that is valuable in this economy because it's not something that can easily go away or be taken to another place. So these are some of the reasons why uh, at Smart Growth America we regard small-scale manufacturing as an important component for many communities in looking to uh, pursue a place-making strategy for economic development and enjoy success in this century. Uh, you'll hear some more details uh, from my colleagues who will follow, uh, beginning with uh, the work that the National League of Cities has done uh, in this area, and I'll turn it now over to Emily Robbins. Great. Thanks so much for having me be a part of this conversation today. And again, I'm Emily Robbins, the Principal Associate for Economic Development with the National League of Cities. And for those of you who aren't already familiar with our organization, we're a membership association for the over 19,000 cities and towns across the country. And our job is really to connect city officials and staff with the information and resources they need to be better leaders on issues like small business development and strengthening their local economies. And what I want to do today is first talk a bit about why we wrote this new report, Discovering Your City's Maker Economy with Recast City, Etsy, and the Urban Manufacturing Alliance. And then I'm going to review some of the key takeaways from this report. And finally, I'm going to talk through some higher level guidance on how local government leaders can be involved in supporting their local makers and small scale manufacturers. So first off, we wrote this report because we felt as though maker entrepreneurs were missing in some ways from city economic development strategies. And so again, by definition, the maker businesses we're talking about are very small micro-enterprises that create handmade goods and products. So if you imagine the types of folks you typically see at a farmer's market or a holiday market selling things like art and soap, jewelry, and jams, those are some of your city's makers. But what's tricky is these business owners may not be on your radar yet. And that's because they typically don't fit into the traditional mold of what a small business needs. They may not need brick and mortar retail space or production space. They also might not be reaching out to your city for help with loans or grants. And oftentimes they might just be one person who is working on their business from home. And it's really important that these businesses not be overlooked by cities and economic development agencies because they can have a really big impact on the health of your local economy. In fact, it's estimated that FC sellers generated about $2.8 billion in worldwide sales just last year. And it's also significant to point out that these maker businesses are quite literally everywhere. There's another Etsy stat that found there are currently local makers with an online shop in 99.9% .9 of all U.S. counties. So moving on to uh, this slide that we have up here, um, something else I want to highlight is that the emerging maker economy can play a role in making access to entrepreneurship more accessible and also more inclusive. And what I mean by that is the barriers and startup costs to opening a maker business are often not as high if you compare it to other types of small businesses. So you know, for example, a maker entrepreneur doesn't often need to raise a large amount of capital up front or worry about hiring and paying, paying employees. And in many cases, a maker won't need to pay for a studio or a kitchen space because they can, again, work from home. And so for this equity reason in particular, we feel it's really important for local governments to start thinking about maker entrepreneurship as an opportunity for individuals from all backgrounds and income levels. And we also want to encourage cities 
to start thinking about this as a workforce development strategy in terms of helping more individuals be self-employed in these creative maker businesses. So another key takeaway is our perspective that municipal governments should absolutely be involved in supporting their local makers. And you know, interestingly, I was asked the other day if the maker economy could exist on its own without any support from government. And you know, it certainly can, but it's our belief that when mayors and council members and economic development staff get involved and provide that extra layer of a support system, it's just such a value add and really helps catalyze the growth of this movement. And another thing that we also know um, that the other speakers have alluded to is that cities are really moving away from this traditional economic development approach of luring one small business or luring one large business rather as a job creation strategy, and instead are really looking to support their local homegrown small businesses. And maker entrepreneurs should absolutely be a part of the focus on supporting your city's small businesses. And another thing is we've also heard anecdotally that maker entrepreneurs oftentimes don't think of local government as a natural partner. So it really is incumbent on city leaders and their staff to make that first move and proactively approach and support their local makers. So we know that maker entrepreneurs are out there and we know that we might not be supporting their needs as best as possible. So what can cities do about this? So on the next and last slide, we list out four of the key ways that city governments can help maker businesses. And those four ways are by creating a supportive business environment, driving demand for locally made goods, providing access to affordable production space, and then finally advocating for state policies that support makers. So running through what these, each of these mean for cities, number one, creating a supportive business environment really means including your maker businesses in your city's already established programs for local business development. So things like business planning workshops and networking events and assistance with marketing. And it can also mean mapping out where your local makers exist in the neighborhood and asking them what kind of support that they need, or thinking about creating a mayor's maker council to help advise the city on how to support maker businesses. For number two, driving demand for locally made goods, what this is all about is cities playing a role in showcasing their makers through made local branding campaigns, and also inviting makers to sell their items at city-run festivals and markets. And another thing that local governments can do to help dr drive demand for locally made goods is by purchasing them themselves at City Hall or encouraging anchor institutions to buy local as well. And a couple examples of this are um, purchasing from local caterers for lunch meetings or if you're hosting some neighborhood office hours, you know, think about hosting them at a local coffee shop instead of at one of the larger chain stores. Providing access to affordable production space. Um, this is where cities can offer up uh, maker spaces, shared kitchen space, or incubator pro programs for maker industries and small scale manufacturers. And cities can also think a bit more creatively about their zoning codes for commercial space and figuring out ways to carve out small production retail spaces where makers can create and also sell their items in the same place. And then finally, advocating for state policies that support makers. Um, this is really all about removing any restrictions on home-based businesses. So for example, in some cities it's actually um, not legal to sell baked goods that were made in a home kitchen for food safety reasons, but many states are actually pushing to get rid of that particular law. And this is also really about creating incentives for buying from local artists. And another example of this is in Rhode Island there is actually a tax exemption on items purchased from local artists. So that is sort of a higher level overview and hopefully this helps provide some fresh perspective on how to support this emerging maker economy. And with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Ilana from Recast City to dive a little bit deeper into some of these strategies. And I look forward to sticking around for the Q&A at the end of the hour. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. So you've now heard uh, some great overviews about why 
cities should get engaged around small-scale manufacturing and maker businesses, both from a placemaking perspective, as Chris outlined, as well as from an economic development and inclusive opportunity perspective, as Emily outlined. What I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about um, the different tools that are being used across the country um, by uh, local jurisdictions who are interested in engaging around this because they've already recognized um, that they want to be able to provide this tool to their uh, constituents, to their business community. And as I mentioned before, um, my firm, Recast City, uh, I work directly with cities, uh, other civic leaders, real estate developers um, to engage around the small scale manufacturing business community and how this really becomes a part of our neighborhood development um, and really a part of repositioning both our economy and our neighborhoods um, so that our entire community benefits. The first topic area I'm going to cover, and, the, and there's two of them. One is about uh, how to broadly support the local small manufacturing community uh, and some of the ways to do that. And then secondarily, we'll be more focused on the land use side of how to provide the support. So first of all, we want to look at how we find and connect with these businesses. And Emily started to make reference to some of these practices. Um, you can find, the number one question I get from people in their community is how do we find these businesses? Because many of them are not registered as manufacturing or production businesses. Um, so we, in terms of ones that are creating um, consumer goods, um, you can find them at fairs and holiday pop-up markets um, and small business networking events. Um, you can help, you can find them at your commercial shared kitchens or maker spaces if you have them. Um, and the ones that you find, you can connect to these resources. Um, one of the key pieces is, that we found is to connect these businesses to any existing local branding effort or training and entrepreneurship program. Um, you can go to, in this instance, uh, it, I was identifying small-scale production businesses at a, a cultural religious festival. It was a Diwali festival, and this woman's business, Silver Paisley, creates these displays for candles. Um, she has a very specific market that she's reaching through this and may not have participated in a broader farmer's market um, with other uh, consumer goods, um, but was key for her to reach at this market. So I encourage folks to go out into the pop-up markets, into your farmer's markets, cultural events within the community and identify these businesses, but also look at it from the technology side. Um, who, where are the industrial 3D printers or laser cutters in the community? Do you have any? Is somebody providing these services within the community? Um, because there are a lot of national businesses now that they can connect to and pro be providing services across the country as well. Secondarily, uh, we encourage communities to create a supportive business environment. So that includes things like investing in a maker, micro business incubator, and accelerator program specific to these small production businesses providing access to capital in micro-grants. Uh, oftentimes this is around uh, $5,000 or even $10,000 grants or uh, low-cost loans that small businesses can access. And particularly in our more rural communities, ensuring that there is affordable broadband access to these businesses because most of them are selling online as well as within the community, and we want to make sure that they're getting that kind of broader reach. In Knoxville, Tennessee, the mayor created is working very extensively to create a supportive business environment and has created the Mayor's Maker Council, which uh, was mentioned previously. And this is a diverse set of individuals who have different kinds of maker businesses in Knoxville who both can provide the mayor with feedback about how her policies are impacting the maker business community, but that they can also figure out what kinds of support they need and advocate for those needs together, as well as holding an annual summit, maker summit in Knoxville to bring this community together so that individuals can mentor each other and support each other in their business growth. The third point is to really look at how to drive the demand for locally made products. And Emily referred to this, this these made local brands uh, made in Baltimore is a great example of this. Um, it gives these small-scale producers an opportunity to showcase what they produce um, and a regional platform from which to, to be able to attract more business. It also allows people to connect designers and small manufacturers together within a region 
um, so that somebody who has additional small manufacturing capacity could take in new projects from local designers. And this is a really important way to create that economic echo chamber within our communities, as well as encouraging our cities and our anchor institutions to procure directly from these businesses within the community. As I mentioned, Made in Baltimore brand, this was their launch event earlier this year, and they've done a lot of work to reach across racial lines within Baltimore to build a very diverse community of business owners and really celebrate not only the locally made products, but the individuals who are the business owners and the producers within that sector. And fourth, we want to look at how do we advocate for state policies that support makers and microbusinesses. As Emily mentioned, um, the state or local sales tax exemption for artisan products is important to look at. And um, we also want to look at all of those regulations that are related to home-based businesses, definitely the food cottage laws um, within the state, um, but also what, how much business can people be doing out of their homes. Um, and as they grow out of that or if they need access to specific tools, what is the jurisdiction's role in providing that access? Um, Rhode Island in particular has the sales tax exemption for art and artisan products, um, but other communities are looking at how are they benefiting micro businesses um, as they scale as well. Um, and, and as they create new jobs within the community, how are they benefiting from uh, new job creation benefits, incentives that are in the state, but may usually only qualify for folks that are creating 50 jobs as opposed to one or two or five at a time? How are we including this business community as part of our benefits? And then we need to think about how we're going to apply land use tools to this as well, because this is the other major area we can uh, address. So access to affordable and safe space for production is key to this. Um, not only micro retail opportunities, which are four to 700 square foot spaces, which are great, low-risk retail spaces where folks can do both production and retail of their goods um, within a community, um, but also our local markets and, fe and festivals. And then the potential to provide incentives for developers to create affordable workspace in rehab and new construction. We provide incentives for affordable housing within our community, which is essential. Uh, we should also be creating incentives for affordable and safe workspace to retain these good paying middle-income jobs within our community and within close proximity to where the people live. In St. Louis, a local community development corporation is actually partnering with the St. Louis Makes uh, brand, uh, the DeSalle Community Development uh, Corporation purchased this building uh, a little over a year ago and is uh, rehabbing this industri multi-floor industrial building uh, to accommodate many different small-scale industrial uh, tenants, uh, everywhere down from 500 square foot spaces all the way up to 2,000 square feet, maybe even 5,000 square foot spaces, because the building is 80,000 square feet. Um, and the CDC uh, sees that it is their responsibility not only to ensure uh, stability in the housing market within this neighborhood, but also to retain uh, manufacturing jobs within the neighborhood that historically had these jobs here. And so they're stepping into this, this space as well. We also need to look at how we're funding these programs. So the funding might be directly into an entrepreneur loan fund for people of color and women-owned production businesses, but it also might be a community development block grants or tax increment financing that creates incentives for developers to provide these small-scale manufacturing production space at an affordable rate. What are the different networks that we're connecting people with, both from the business ownership perspective as well as from the land use and development standpoint? Uh, from a business funding perspective, Lowell, Massachusetts has a great program where several of their locally, local banks have partnered together to create one pool for high-risk investment in a new and growing small-scale manufacturing and locally owned service or retail businesses, um, and they will take recommendations out of a local incubator program to be able to provide low-cost loans and grants to these businesses to be able to get established and scale and stay in Lowell. And this is one way that the local banking community can come together and really create this very strong incentive for businesses 
particularly a small scale production business, is uh, to stay within a community. We also need to think in detail how we're encouraging this kind of use in local development. As I mentioned, that the financing of CDBG funds or TIF might be key, but we can also look at our zoning and our codes. So what is allowed within our commercial zones and our building codes? Um, there is artisan manufacturing land use definition that's been adopted in Nashville, Tennessee, and in Indianapolis, and another, a number of other cities and counties that allows small-scale production businesses to be a permitted use within a commercial zone, making it much easier for these businesses to move into a retail area that might have vacant storefronts or a main street. Um, adding this artisan manufacturing definition to the local land use code is a really key first step. Um, the other opportunities to create incentives for uh, small uh, micro-enterprise space for uh, small-scale manufacturing businesses, either on the ground floor or on upper floor, floors, depending on if they're uh, directed completely at wholesale and don't need a storefront, or one storefront that had been there for a while and vacant could be subdivided and actually serve a number of small-scale maker businesses. And then also thinking very clearly about what to do with city-owned property or underutilized property within the community. What kind of incentives are we creating? What kind of requirements is the city putting in on city-owned properties that might be surplus um, so that these properties include a minimum amount of small-scale manufacturing space as they're being redeveloped? Uh, one of the great examples from a zoning perspective is in San Francisco, their production distribution and repair zone, their PDR zone, um, got amended a bunch of years ago so that in specific neighborhoods where industrial property is being underutilized, uh, developers can build new office space on that property, on part of that property, as long as they're building new multi-floor industrial space as well and working with a third party to verify that that industrial space is in fact used by small-scale manufacturing industrial users within the community because they want to make sure that they're adding to the capacity of having more affordable production space within the city. And then lastly, really thinking carefully about cross-sector partnerships. That includes about how we build our network. Um, are, we build, are we working with existing cultural organizations, ethnic organizations, racially diverse organizations that may also already know of producers within their communities, bringing all those people together to create an inclusive network of producers? Are we working with anchor institutions to help them create by local commitments or local philanthropy or corporations who could both buy local as well as be investors uh, or sponsors of a makerspace or workforce training programs, and certainly looking at community colleges and our existing workforce development programs to make sure that they're helping connect the dots and training people for um, these kinds of hands-on problem-solving positions um, but also making sure that they're training for existing jobs that are within the community. And so one great example of that is from Twin Falls, Idaho, where uh, they saw actually larger manufacturing coming in through Chobani and some other industries and partnered with the local workforce development entity and community college to create a training space and apprenticeship program um, so that individuals would graduate with hands-on experience with the tools um, that the local manufacturing needed already. And obviously that kind of training also can help individuals who are interested in being entrepreneurs spin off um, and create some of their own businesses as well within the community. And so uh, we definitely encourage you to think about how you do this within your own community, who are your small-scale manufacturing businesses, um, what is the outcome that you're trying to achieve? Who should benefit from it? What kind of businesses or scale of businesses are most important for you? What part of your community, where in your neighborhoods do you want to uh, connect uh, people and these businesses? Where do you want to locate them? And what is your role in achieving that? Um, and in terms of thinking about your role, who else do you need at the table um, to get there? And really thinking very comprehensively about all of those different pieces. You can find more information about uh, Recast City at recastcity.com. Um, but now we are going to go to our Q&A portion of our program and take some questions uh, from online. One of the questions that uh, came up in the conversation uh, online is about 
how to do this in small rural communities and towns. Um, and in particular, how to create a partnership with a community development corporation. Um, Chris or Emily or Ryan, uh, would any of you like to talk a little bit about this from the small or rural community perspective? Chris, from the perspective of working with the, the smaller uh, cities and towns from the other Smart Growth America projects, what do you think is key for a rural community or rural city to take on a, a concept like this, especially for their, their downtown or Main Street? Well, I think frequently such communities have fairly limited capacity in terms of you know their own staff resources and their you know, their own ability to do a lot of analysis. They you know typically have limited budgets and limited staff resources. So, uh, but you know at the same time it takes some kind of initiative. So uh, political leadership would be particularly important to pull together the folks, the various folks that you know pieces of this, people own property, uh, people who operate businesses. And, uh, their own local, to, to the extent that they exist, their own local economic development uh, uh, efforts, the folks who head that up in whatever form it takes. It often in, involves trying to get something done on a more regional basis where you have a little greater reach, um, but, but frequently find in, in those places often there isn't that, that kind of experience of working closely and across sectors and across different governments. Um, so some of the first things would be just simply to pull people together to discuss this, to you know, to get conversations going, because there may ultimately be synergies that you know you can achieve with having, uh, you know, again the community of people who own the relevant properties, the community of people who are doing various kinds of work, uh, but you may not get to that if there isn't you know an institutional framework within which they regularly interact. Um, and so for, for many places, that's going to be the first most important thing is just to get people into a room to talk about the possibilities and open, you know, uh, some folks' eyes to some possibilities they, they might never have uh, had occasion to think of or be aware of. Thank yeah, you. and I can jump in here too. I think um, just to build off of Chris's point, I think what is to the advantage of smaller communities is that they still have makers. Um, we know that they're everywhere. This is not an issue that necessarily has to be one that is a large city issue. I think what maybe needs to be a little bit tweaked in an approach for a smaller community is really um, providing that platform, as Chris was mentioning, for the makers to get together and empower them to really share what they need and to sort of carry forward their success. Um, I think that's probably going to be really critical for some of those smaller and medium-sized communities. Thank you. Um, and in terms of partnering with a community development corporation, the example from St. Louis uh, is a great one. There's also a community development corporation in Indianapolis um, that's doing a very similar project. So um, we do start. We have started to see a, a trend of. CDC is starting to pay attention to uh, job availability and job location uh, within the community as well. Ryan, would you like to add to the conversation about uh, engaging within, with the smaller rural communities? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I just want to echo a couple of things that other people have said. I think it, it starts with asset mapping and taking a really broad lens of what are the assets, what are the institutions that exist, and how can we leverage those strengths into, um, into something that could be an economic development opportunity, and sort of understanding where those strengths come from will lead you to the next part of the plan. That will give you an indication of who to talk to. If you're a strong agricultural region, as a lot of rural places are, uh, moving, in, moving in the agricultural direction could make sense for that economy. So um, you want to start with some asset mapping. You want to start with some cluster analysis. And you can use the uh, clustermapping.us tool that is funded uh, in part by an EA grant um, as a place to explore your local clusters. Um, I also want to echo Chris's idea of, of leveraging the assets of the region. It's not just about what that one town can do. It's about what the region can bring, and that's a really important part uh, and a really important dynamic, particularly when you're talking about doing a project at scale um, that would be, 
you know, you could find those assets in, in, in an urban setting in a few blocks, or in a rural setting, you may have to get a few towns together. Um, but it's it's this whole, this whole idea of cooperation and aggregating up, and and using a strategic process. Um, I'd also encourage people um, who are thinking about partnering with an economic development organization is to go ahead and look at their economic development districts and figure out which organizations may they might be able to help them uh, set up that partnership. Right. That's a that's a great, great point. And, and really making sure to think comprehensively like that is going to be key, um, both in terms of building the partnerships to make something happen in, uh, within the, the smaller city or town, um, as well as in terms of finding the businesses. Because uh, one of the things that I've seen is that uh, within rural communities, you are even more likely to have the businesses be home-based um, because people have the space, the shed, the garage, the backyard, the or even the kitchen um, to be doing that production. Um, and so being able to get people to come out and be a part of the economic development strategy and the, and the business community um, within your downtown or on your main street um, takes some really purposeful outreach and recruitment um, and potentially some incentives to help start filling those storefronts um, with these production businesses. Um, another one of the questions that came to us is about specifically about how to find um, the local assets within the community, which certainly builds on uh, what we're talking about, um, both within a, a local community but also across different regions. Um, you know, and just as a way to start uh, answering this question, the, the made in or the local brands are really key to this because well, one of the things that we've found from the existing local brands uh, in San Francisco and Baltimore, and, and there, we're starting to see them in a lot of the smaller cities and towns as well, is that it's a really strong way to help these businesses network with each other and start partnering with each other on products. So, for instance, there is a, a designer and producer in Washington, D.C., who creates uh, handbags and leather goods um, uh, called Stitch and Rivet. And the owner, Katie Sack, um, now is partnering with a small-scale manufacturer, uh, textile producer in Baltimore to produce a couple of her products because um, she connected with them through the different made local brands. Um, and so that echo chamber of really growing uh, the economic impact of each investment um, is really key to uh, connect across those, those local brands. Um, and one of the co-authors of the uh, Discovering Your City's Maker Economy, uh, one of the co-authors, Urban Manufacturing Alliance, has a great tool online for communities interested in creating local brands as well. So um, with that, uh, we will wrap up our uh, webinar for today. We thank you all for joining us. Um, and if you have any additional questions, um, you can contact Smart Growth America uh, with those questions, and they can reach uh, all of the speakers here today uh, as well. Thank you very much.